to begin. Here we go. We're going live. And hello, Augies Worldwide. I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG, here with another episode of our Thursday evening live stream. And welcome. Good to see you. I've been gone for a couple weeks because of a little touch of COVID. Actually, because it was a little bit more than a little touch, but uh, I'm on the mend. It's been 10 days since I was diagnosed, so that's supposed to be the time that I can start uh, coming out of hibernation and, and going and do things. I think my, my voice is probably still a little bit weird, but welcome, welcome to all of you. My first official foray back into the real world was last night. Um, there's a, a little club out in the San Jose area in California uh, where they get together on Zoom. And they asked me to get together with them and had a very interesting conversation for a couple hours. Uh, one of the presentations I gave was the presentation on a high altitude electromagnetic pulse, which they seem to find very interesting. Um, so I am um, here tonight and we will go through everything that we can. Now, one of the things I have to point out is because of COVID, I never did get a prize designated for January. And we're kind of running out of January. So by the time you got the cards and letters to me and so on, so we'll just skip January and go on ahead to uh, February. I do have one here. Well, that's interesting. There's nothing in it. But uh, I wonder if that's this one. This guy wrote in and said some very nice things. So I kept his P0KAT. He says uh, he just passed his amateur extra. He says, I have a strong electro. And this is K0KAT. Um, I have a strong electrical and mechanical background, but your amateur extra videos on the AWRL website help me out quite a lot. You have a wonderful personality that is so conducive for learning. I enjoy watching your Thursday night live streams on YouTube when I can. I love your channel because you actually talk about and demonstrate amateur radio fundamentals and practices. Most of the other YouTube amateur radio channels act like the Home Shopping Network or QVC. They just want to sell you something from some vendor or from their own store. I hope you keep up the good work and know that what you're doing is very well received and respected. Thank you, Dave, and God bless from Neil uh, Kronfeld. Thank you very much. I really enjoy it. It's, it's actually this sort of thing that keeps me going. Um, when people, when I find out that, you know, I'm, <clears throat> I'm changing lives or, or doing something like that, that, that makes it seem worthwhile. I have this, um, sort of compulsion that I have to feel that I'm actually being useful to people around me and doing some good in the world. So this is my method of trying to do that. Now, I want to mention uh, also in passing a uh, comment from somebody. And I don't have a real good way of recording comments. So, um, I mean, they're online and all that, but you can't get a printout or whatever that I know of. If somebody knows of one, let me know. Anyway, this guy commented, he says, why do hams and cis on spreading their call signs everywhere. You give up your privacy when you do that. That is true. But I think most hams since the beginning of ham radio are very proud of what they've accomplished. And they want to uh, be part of the fraternity and really nowadays sorority too of uh, amateur radio operators and then all revolves around our call sign and I tend to think of myself not as Dave 
whose call sign is KE0OJ, but I tend to think of myself as KE0OJ. And so that's how I introduce myself and we make a big deal of it here. And most of you in the comments here put your call signs in. We're proud of what we've done. We've done a lot. And I'm not saying that in a in an absence of humility kind of way, but we've we've done a lot to become a member of this community. And we like to share that. <clears throat> call signs have since the beginning of ham radio been universally used as an identifier. Uh, when I first got into radio after getting out of college, well, I got into it in college, uh, there were two parts to your license. You had a station license, and that is actually what had the call sign. And then you had the personal license, which gave you permission to operate a station. Now, if you operated your own station, you identified that by just using your call sign. If you were operating somebody else's station, you would use their station slash and your own call sign there. So that's all changed, of course. And there's no uh, pretense about, uh, I'm looking at my license up here, there's no pretense about trying to um, maintain an artificial difference between a station license <clears throat> and the actual operator uh, license. So, um, I mean, people go around, if you go to any ham fest or something, you will often see people with name badges and so on, and they've got their call sign, and there are a number of people who are very public in theirs, like some of the people in QST and, and uh, of course, the guy who runs the CQ magazine and so on. The, the, the Gordon, not Gordon Lightfoot, Gordon, not Gordon Well, Jeez, we want to correct the Enigma code. Um, Gordo, anyway. I don't remember his last name. He is extremely well-known in ham radio. People like... Rayleigh Hollingsworth and so on, uh, Joe Taylor, others who are very prominent hams uh, that a lot of people have heard from and understand what they're trying to say and so on. If all had gone to plan, Loretta and I would be just pulling into a hotel or something in... Um, Flagstaff, Arizona. And then tomorrow we would go down to Whitman and uh, see her uh, cousin who winters down there along with an infinitely large family. Um, they are actually from Craig, Colorado. They are major, major cowboys. And um, this is by cowboys, I mean rodeo. And they do rodeo of all different kinds. And it's a it's an interesting world, you know. I mean, this is everything to these kids. That's how they're raised, is in their 4-H and in their barrel racing and whatever it might be. Uh, they're major into that. And then on um, Sunday morning, we would have gone over to Quartz Fest. Uh, that's not going to happen because although... COVID may officially be done with us, but I don't know that we're done with the after effects of COVID. In fact, I know we're not. Um, so next month, there is down in uh, Buckeye, Arizona, which is on the very west side of Phoenix, there is um, an airport there, and they're having an air show, a weekend-long air show three days. And so I'm going to go down to that. What I'd love to do is fly down to it. It's not that far away. It could be a one-day flight. Um, but I will probably drive down and uh, stay there because uh, in order for me to really go into 
the flying, I'd be, like to be more confident of my landings than I am now. And uh, the problem with the aircraft being an hour north of here is, first of all, you got to line up an instructor. And then i got to get the airplane started, and it's not wanting to start on these cold days. So we've done things to warm up the airplane engine, put blankets over the whole nine yards. And if I can get it started, then I can get out and get some time and do a bunch of landings of different types and so on and try to become more confident in those landings. And then the trip from here to uh, Buckeye would be very simple. Go from here to Cortez, Cortez down to Sholo, Arizona, and from Sholo over to Buckeye. The problem, of course, is you've got to pass through or over or around the Phoenix area because that's a Class B airport, and basically all of the airspace over the Phoenix area is encapsulated into this Class B airspace. And, and uh, I would have to uh, do enough air traffic control conversations to get around it and so on. But you can go around it. If you stay outside of the area, you're okay. So I could go south of it or something like that. Um, I really want to do this air show because it's clearly impossible to do quartz vest. Um, and I know a lot of hams, a lot of you guys are pilots too. And don't know if you might be trying that. You might comment on whether your airplane is starting in this cold weather. Seems like the entire nation is gripped tightly in a um, in this cold wave. Right now the temperature here is 33 degrees with 7, are you ready for this, 7.7 percent humidity which gives us a dew point of 26. So it'd have to get a lot colder before we get ice or frost or, or whatever. We've been very fortunate so far this year, no ice storms. Ice storms are very rare here, but they do happen. And uh, right now the antennas that I have up and operating for HF, I've got the Step IR, Big IR, and the uh, MFJ Hexby. Those are the only two I have up. Uh, recently, um, we did a, a video about a um, tri-band fan inverted V that worked extremely well. And you've probably seen that video. And as it turns out, if you put up a dipole for 40. You've got one for 15. It, I mean, it doesn't tune perfectly, but it's close enough that you can get under 2 to 1 SWR across the band and operate on 15 also. And this was the dipole that started out all the questions about, because it's made of insulated wire, and at the end of it, I've got it wrapped back quite a bit to, to get the right length. And somebody asked the question then, does it matter that you're wrapping back your insulated wire? And so we actually did a test, two antennas, we did two antennas, 40 meters, uh, put them up identically, although we couldn't do it at the same time. Um, one insulated, one bare copper, and in both cases wrapped back. And the bare copper, obviously when you're wrapping back, you're shorting out the part that you're wrapping back. When you're wrapping back insulated wire, it's the capacitance between that and the main wire that uh, causes it to all kind of all become one. Well, let's see what we've got here in the way of uh, comments. Uh, the first one is from Dennis Gross. Says, hello, Optical Man Jeff. Hi, Dave and all loggies. Sioux Fall, South Dakota, where it's minus two below zero and clear. We had four inches of snow in the morning. 
Uh, if it's clear, it's going to get a whole lot colder as the night goes on. Bill Myers says, Hello Dave and all Augies. Here in northern Wisconsin, it is currently 4 degrees Fahrenheit. We had minus 12 Fahrenheit this morning, but at least some sunshine. Uh, Bill Myers, let's see, he also says, Hello Dave, hopefully the COVID didn't affect you and your wife very severely. I would not say that we had severe cases. It felt severely bad, I will tell you that. I had a fairly simple case. Um, I just had COVID, but my wife ended up in the hospital for two or three days while they dealt with some concomitant issues having to do with that. In fact, it's a bit of a blessing in disguise. They discovered a digestive issue she has that has troubled her for a long time, and now she kind of knows what it is. And the treatment they're doing for it seems to be really helping. She's home now. I will tell you, when she was gone, <clears throat> and I was trying to take care of myself, uh, and in that brain fog that you get in COVID, it was really scary, actually. And they wouldn't let me into the hospital to be with my wife. They said that's too much COVID in one room. So I <clears throat> stayed down there. I took my wife down to the hospital because um, because she was having trouble breathing. So um, she's still on oxygen right now, and I, I use it at night. So... I would not wish COVID on my worst enemy. That was pretty bad. It's the first time I've had it. There are a lot of people out there who've had it multiple times, and I guess each instance is a little different. The main thing that got me was a headache, sore throat, and body aches everywhere, my whole body, top to bottom. And I will admit that every so often... I would dip into my stash of hydrocodone and take one of those because that would, that would eliminate the pain and I could sleep. Um, I just did that for a couple, three days and then went back to uh, Tylenol because Tylenol will do the same thing, although not as well as, uh, as one of those others. Hydrocodone actually has Tylenol in it. Hydrocodone is codeine, and um, in its pure form, it can readily be abused. And so they put acetaminophen in it, 325 milligrams. And the idea being that if you take too many, you're going to damage your liver with the acetaminophen. So that is how they keep people from overdosing on those hydrocodones. Some people, of course, don't care, and they're going to overdo, overdo it over anyway. Um, what happened with that Oxycontin, which I've never had, it is pure. It's heroin, what it is. And the idea being that if people took the tablets... They wouldn't be able really to overdose much. But what people discovered was if they crushed the tablets, mixed them with water, it became injectable. Uh, you're really holding your life in your hands when you do this sort of thing because it's really easy to overdose, as we learned over the last two or three years with the opioid crisis. But... This is a case where, like hydrocodone, they put something in the pill to keep people from overdoing it. But they did not do that in the case of OxyContin. And uh, a whole bunch of people got in a whole bunch of trouble because of that. A lot of money's going to change hands on that one. So, that, and that story's not done yet. It's not really done. Okay. Um, anyway, that's the little story about COVID. Uh, Mark Perrin, high day of 16 degrees Fahrenheit, snowing in Naramata, B.C., Victor Alpha 7, D.L.C. Hello. Chuck Schreiber, 
Good evening, Dave and all Augies, N5KVO from the hill country of South Texas. Currently 55 degrees. Go ahead and rub it in. Go ahead, go ahead. Hope you're doing better. I am. I am doing better. KE0RM, or Radio Mercy, says hello. Leo Gustafson says hello, Dave and all Augies, KK7CLY from Albany, Oregon. Getting out of the deep freeze and rain today. That's good. I hope you get lots of snow up in your mountains. That'll be good for the coming year. Fill all the reservoirs. Um, we're getting a lot of snow here in Colorado. We have not had much snow this winter until this last couple storms came through. We've still got several inches of snow in the backyard, even though it's been sunny for days. It's just been so cold. But um, we need snow in our Rockies so that we get water in the Colorado River. And that goes down to those two major reservoirs, Parker Dam and and uh, Hoover Dam, Lake Mead. And it turns out that that is the basic water source for a huge number of people. They've started already in Phoenix. They won't give out building permits if you don't have a source of water, which is wise, I think. And uh, Lake Mead has gone up about 18 inches this year. It's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's like saying, I'm going to climb Mount Kilimanjaro, and I've gone 10 feet so far. Um, the Lake Mead and the lake behind Lake Powell are pretty empty. Now, um, Lake Powell is interesting, and I'm probably using the wrong words for it. There's a name for the dam and a name for the reservoir. And it's uh, by Parker in Arizona, which is on the south side of it. They never did completely fill the dam because, as it turned out, they were going to flood too many um, key archaeological artifacts. They were going to just flood them. And one of the things that's happened since the lake level has come down so much is that a number of the ones they did flood have become visible again. Now, that's not the case with Lake Mead. That's a, basically a hole in the ground. Um, and so, I have seen, with my own eyes, I have seen Lake Mead spill. I've seen the water go down into the overflow. With my own eyes, I saw that. That was many, many years ago. And that was back when... <clears throat> if you wanted to get from Nevada to Arizona, you had to go across the dam. It was a two-lane road, and that was it. That was the choke point, the single point of failure there. Now they've put in a huge bridge that they could not even have attempted 50 years ago, but a huge bridge across. So if you're not looking, you won't even see the dam. Um, but uh, very interesting story from... Uh, historical perspective as to how that dam was built and as hams were always interested and we look at these big things and we go how how'd you do that so and they did it with 1930s technology and um, a 1930s disregard for safety they maintain to this day that no workers were buried in the dam. It doesn't mean that no workers died. A lot of workers died. One of the big problems was lung issues, because and, and they could have fixed this very, very easily, either with water-powered drills, like they do in coal mines now, or just spray down the place every 15 minutes. But they were in these massive tunnels, chipping away, 
lot of this was done by hand. And the dust in there was horrible. And it wasn't just a dust dust. This is rock dust. And rock dust is composed of microscopic particles that if you look at them under the microscope are extremely jagged. And so they get stuck in your lungs. It's very hard to get them out of there. And this can obviously kill somebody. Very similar to black lung. And anyway, they built it. They built it in uh, many months prior to when they said they would have it done. There were apparently some incentives that the contractor got regardless of how many people they killed in the process. And the government representative finally says, look, it says in the contract you're going to build worker housing. Let's see it. And so they had diverted some workers and they had to build a house a day or they were fired. Remember, this was during the 30s. The employer could ask anything of you and if you didn't want to do it, out you go. There's somebody in line behind you. So, you know, don't let the door hit you in the you-know-what on the way out. It was the same way with uh, the Montrose High School. They built it at the same time. And there were stories of people that, that, that bricklayers built that thing one brick at a time. And there were stories they'd pile the bricks in the wheelbarrow and you had to run that wheelbarrow to where it needed to be. If you couldn't run it, out you go. We get somebody else right behind you. So things have changed. Okay. Um, hi, Dave. 16 degrees Fahrenheit and snowing. We, we took a look at that in Aramana, D.C. Uh, 55 in Texas. Radio Mercy. Hello. Oops. I think I lost my place here. Okay, Eric Sun, hello, Dave and all. Michael Cade, KI5SBA, hello, Dave, good evening to all. Ralph Leland, hi, Dave and everyone, K4TA in Fork Union, Virginia, 35 degrees, 56 relative humidity. Pedro Marias, Hi, Dave. Just got a Yesu 710. I like it better than my 7300, the audio and fun factor. Yeah, the 710 has that so-called AESS audio. Excuse me for just a moment here. Let's turn that back on. Um, well, one of the things that... Uh, oh, I don't know. It'll come back. Okay. Um, the 710, the AESS, is an acoustic system that provides a sense of depth to the sound which is kind of nice because you separate the signals orally and you can spatially pick out a signal. Uh, this works best with Morse code, but it, it can also work in very crowded bands during contests and so on. That it uh, <coughs> gives you a chance to hear something really good. Um, it's apparently not something that they've tried to simulate in headphones. Um, the, <coughs> <coughs> the headphones and stuff, they could. I mean, this is, you know, this audio device is taking electrical signals and is doing a transform on them with this acoustic stuff. Can that be duplicated electronically? Absolutely it can. Uh, but of course, this is, gives the unique selling to the 
Yesu FT710, very popular radio. It looks really nice. Pedro says, hope COVID will not be long lasting. Wishing the best. Thank you. Darren Poole, hello from, hello from all from Southeast Mississippi, KI50AI. Leo says, in my ham free seemingly area, I operate in if I introduce myself by my call sign. They think I was having a stroke. <laughs> Oh my, yeah, Leo has mentioned to me in a couple emails that he seems to be in a ham radio desert. And uh, my standard suggestion is, well, get a friend into ham radio and form a club. Uh, there's a guy down in, no, not Pacoima, Pacoima's out in the valley. Um, Pomona, I think, somewhere out there in the Los Angeles area, who did just that. He lived in a, uh, a manufactured home community, and he uh, became a ham, and so he started getting all of his friends to get into ham radio with him. And what that did meant that uh, they were doing things together, and they met every week, not once a month, but every week. Every Saturday, there'd be an activity. Needless to say, these guys grew pretty close. Last I heard, they had about 30. So, that's working really good. Okay. Um, let's, let's see. Okay. Alexei Spirit has got some um, what looks like Japanese although I can't tell. There are many, many character-based, or uh, I'm sorry, word-based scripts. Um, in Japan, they have three major ones. Uh, one is pretty easy to parse out for a typewriter and stuff like that. Some of these others are not. There, there, have, there were even attempts at one point to make a keyboard for Japanese, it had close to 2,000 keys. Needless to say, it would be very slow to use. But you'd have the entire language in front of you. And as you know, these languages are ideograph based. So if you have a word, it could be a multi-syllabic word for something is one character. Now in, in kanji, they can have multiple characters. Korean, interestingly, found out this from a friend who went on his mission over there, that um, their language, although it looks weird, you know, it looks ideographic, it's actually alphabetic. And uh, the symbols actually spell out uh, something, so it's different. Of course, Chinese is very much a ideographic based language and there are multiple versions of Chinese um, and then you get you pull down into the Burma area and into uh, Hindi areas and so on none of those people use the Roman alphabet and of course you go north you go in the Soviet Union now you're in the Slavic languages and they're not using the Roman alphabet either now, what does that do for Morse code? And the answer is that a kanji-based kind of uh, Morse code, which would have more characters than the 26 Roman characters, um, would have special characters for others so that you could put a coherent message together. And uh, when the U.S. was trying to intercept the Japanese during the or intercept the communications. It was a real issue finding people who could do it because their Morse code is, you know, the Morse code character might be four dits, not an H, it's something else. Um, and then you go over to Germany and, and they have uh, similar things, France too, um, where they have characters that are not in the Roman alphabet. A U with an umlaut, 
um, when they put it on the uh, Enigma machine would be U-E. They put an E after it to emphasize the, to be the equivalent of the umlaut, and they still do that today. Uh, but the way typewriters work over there is you first type the umlaut. Okay, and then the carriage doesn't move. And then you type the letter you want under the umlaut. And then the typewriter moves on to the next character. So that's how they handle that, and you can get really fast at that, of course. There's not a separate key on the typewriter for U umlaut or anything like that. Now, of course, when computing began, what did we start using? ASCII. American Standard Code for Information Interchange. Well, that's great for the Brits and the U.S., but uh, it created other problems. So um, what's used in computers now is not ASCII, but Unicode. Uh, Unicode is a two-byte combination that can be one of many, many things. You think about it, 8 bits will give you 256 different characters. Another 8 bits, 256. So you now have 256 squared possible characters. So a lot of the, the little emojis that you see actually have their own Unicode assigned to them. Because 256 squared is a lot of different uh, letters that, that we can really do there. Okay, let's see. Um, so, uh, Pedro, I'll be very interested to hear how your uh, Yesu 710 comes along. And uh, Darren Poole, hello to all from Southeast Mississippi, KI5OAI. Um, My ham-free area, I operate in, if I introduce myself by my call sign, they think I was having a stroke. That, that is, is really weird. So, uh, Leo thought so. My wife is Japanese. Chris Goodman, K0BLU. Hello, Dave, from St. Cloud, Minnesota, where it's 5 degrees, the 70% relative humidity. Gordon West. Oh, thank you. Gordon, his last name is West who has prepared licensed study guides for years, now will have his guides published by the League. Well, that's good. That's because they're running out of places to put it, and the League is trying to become more inclusive. Now, they publish their own stuff, and I do the videos for those, and we've got to update the general videos this year. David Hatfield, K8EKG, Southeastern Michigan. Uh, Alexei says those are Chinese kanji, but <laughs> I don't know what those means. So, uh, Glenn Martin, hello from far west area of Mississippi. 15 degrees Fahrenheit, 65% relative humidity and snowing. Yeah, we got a little bit of snow today. Leo, I may go for the Gordon West study guides if I go for the extra. Of course, I have a complete set of videos uh, on the ARRL website for the extra. And I'm assuming you're a member of the league, so you could go uh, for those too. Um, Tim Holstaw, Howdy K04 HEK. Uh, best wishes from Tim in Granite Falls, North Carolina. Ham Radio Tectonics, there's a VFR corridor right through Visual Flight Rules corridor right through Phoenix. It goes from north to south, and I honestly don't know if there's an equivalent going east to west because uh, Las Vegas, San Francisco... Salt Lake. I don't have the sectional for Phoenix. I think I do somewhere, but I don't know where it is. An old one. 
but there is a north-south, and if you've got to hit it exactly, you can go straight on through over the airport. But all the aircraft take off east and west from there, so trying to find a safe passage through that might be uh, interesting. Usually what you do is you, <clears throat> you know, the old inverted wedding cake thing, if you go low enough, like under 5,000 feet, you can go pretty close to Phoenix, and you're actually under the Class B airspace. Uh, another thing that you can do is call up the tower and ask for flight following. And uh, they'll tell you what to squawk so they know who you are. And uh, then, you know, they might say, okay, go 270 degrees at 6,500 feet. And, you know, th then you can do that. You've gotten, you now have permission from the tower to do that. Chris Van Slager, KE8WPS from West Broomfield, Michigan. Hope everyone is safe. Chris, I don't recall your name from before, so I'd like to welcome you, especially. What we do here during this period of time is just chat. Now, if anybody has a question, I'll try to answer it. If I cannot answer it, I'll save it either for video um, or for maybe um, the Ask Dave column in uh, QST. Put it in there. Okay. Uh, Leo says, lots of power outages up our way, especially in Portland. I'm going to have to take care of a small limb myself. Well, I hope you're safe up there, Leo. Um, I can understand the power outages. They're, uh, the utilities out there, the electrical utilities are all snake bit. And if there's wind, they want to shut the power off because of what happened in Paradise when they had that fire that was started by a poorly maintained high voltage transmission line actually breaking and dropping the line down onto the lines below created sparks and those sparks caught the grass and the fire that went through paradise was actually not a crown fire it was an undergrowth fire and those who had uh, homes that were properly prepared actually were immune to the fire meaning um, stucco, things like that. And those homes are still standing. Um, and the canopy is still standing. But the problem was, you know, this low fire moving extremely fast ended up being one of the deadliest wildfires in the United States. I mean, nobody ever thought there'd be fire coming through there that fast. I mean, that fire was moving 50 miles an hour, and people couldn't get out. Now, at first when I heard they were blaming the utility for this, I thought, oh, come on, you know, you guys just want to blame the utility. Bad things happen, you know. But then I looked at the it's a kind of a triangle sort of thing like this. There's a hole right there, and that hangs on stuff. Well, one of the insulators from the pole hangs on that. And then down at the bottom, there's a place where a clamp comes up like this and hooks onto the hole in the middle of that thing. Well, that uh, hook area had actually over the years completely wore away to the point where with the wind there it actually broke it and the line dropped and I would have had a lot of sympathy for these people except that it was clear that nobody had ever looked at that line to see if those things were wearing out I mean it took years for that thing to wear out and had anybody seen it they could have fixed it in a heartbeat. But of course they didn't. 
So now the problem out there, you've got Pacific Gas and Electric, which is investor owned. And so you say, well, the investors are going to pay. Well, guess what? It's the rate payers who are going to pay. If somebody gets some money, that money's got to come from somewhere, so they're going to raise the rates. I mean, it's just business. Um, so, Leo, be careful taking care of that limb. Fred, hello, Dave from Frosty, Ohio. Fred, I guess you guys had your first, or was that Iowa that just had a primary there? And they were talking about how on earth are they going to do the primary in that weather? Just terrible. But people, you know, when something's important to them, they'll come out and do it. And it's KD8SMO, Fred. Randall Rash, kr 5 triple E, Howdy from Texas. Amos K, High 2 Optical Man, just a few miles east of Sioux Falls, small world, ready for tomorrow night's cold, minus 20. The coldest I've ever been was in Louisville, over at the Front Range. It's spelled the same as Louisville, Kentucky, but locals pronounce it Louisville. And that's how you can tell somebody is from out of town. If they say Louisville, you know they really don't know the town. Anyway, um, <coughs> I was in a situation where I didn't have an antenna, and I got an R5 in the mail or whatever, UPS. And I put that R5 up. I put that thing up. It was 22 below zero. And I put that thing up. And I got it up. And I got it tuned. And finally, I had an antenna. I didn't have any other antenna at the time. Now, had I thought about it more, I mean, that was an expensive antenna. They're still available. They're several hundred dollars. Um... And they're what I will call unity gain antennas, meaning a dipole, a vertical, um, a multiband vertical, all of that. They all have the same gain, unity gain, which means uh, the same gain as the dipole. Give or take a little bit, but not very much. Okay, so if you try and do a shootout between verticals and dipoles, it's mock snakes, I tell you. One's going to be a little bit better sometimes and not um, other times. So, something to consider. Anyway, I put this antenna up. I liked it. It worked 20 and on up, and that worked just fine. Lefty says, good evening, Dave and Augie's from Davenport, where it's snowing in 10 degrees. Steve Brandon, David, you not feeling well, I am sure we all would understand cutting the stream short. I may do that. Um, and I've been getting a lot of rest. I mean, I sleep over 12 hours a day right at this point. Uh, Stephen, appreciate that. Jeremy Walliser, hello, Dave, brisk minus two here. New ham, general less than a month. I can't explain how much I learned from your channel. Thank you very much. Well, very good, Jeremy, and I hope that you will persevere. Get on the air, learn how HF works. Get some friends at a club or something so you can kind of do some HF stuff with them or something. If you go to dcastler.com slash reference, that's D-C-A-S-L-E-R dot com, slash reference it will give you a list of a bunch of things to get if you get everything on that list you will have what I call the reference station this is a reference design for uh, a station now somebody earlier mentioned the Yesu FT710 if you'd rather put the Yesu 710 in there fine 
but you're still going to need coax and antenna and power supply you know all those things so they're all listed there uh, with things that you can do okay uh, Glenn K greetings and Augie's from the lower Hudson Valley New York from KE2CAE 28 degrees with snow flurries speedy recovery thank you very much Glenn Chris G7VEO good evening from England minus 4C or 24F and it's 2.35 in the morning over there um The Geo says there's a land feature in Oregon here called a hole in the ground, a volcanic result. Uh, there's all kinds of volcanism going on around there, and not everything is always peaceful. <laughs> of course, they've got, oh, thank you, the first chat revenue just showed up. And they're, um, they're having trouble over in Iceland. Uh, they thought they had dodged a bullet with that uh, volcano that's near that town there, Grindavik. And it turns out they didn't dodge the bullet. The bullet came after them again. So far, they've only destroyed about two residences. And what is sad for a number of these people is Grindavik was built as a town to house people who had to evacuate a different volcano. So now if this one is going to be uh, anything bad going on, um, I mean, it's just double whammy for these people. If you're going to live on a volcanic island, you got to watch where you put your next step. Now there is a crack in Grindavik. Somebody fell into it. You know, an earth crack. They didn't find the guy. So, ouch, oh well. Okay, David Ryan, Victor Oscar one, uh, Juliet Mike Oscar, good evening from Senator Wash, LTVA, long-term near Yuma, Arizona. I know there are a number of places down there where you can park your RV for the winter. It's, it's um, what do they call it when you camp? You have absolutely no support. There's a word for it, which is escaping me right now. Um, boondocking. Boondocking. This is boondocking, but you only have to pay like a hundred bucks somewhat more than that and you can stay there the whole winter I think like five months or something like that it's like a super cheap place to go but every so often you got to go into town for gas water dumping and so on okay uh, Warren Baker says hello David August from Chattanooga WA4BAK where it's 31 degrees I have two inches of ice on my steep driveway, which will increase to nine. I guess you're staying home. <clears throat> David Ryan is asking whether I'll attend Quartz Fest this year. Unfortunately not. If I were to attend it this year, we would have left this morning. But we're both still recovering from COVID. Neither of us have the strength to do that. So... I'm coming down next month to Buckeye uh, Airport in Buckeye, Arizona, which is to the west of Phoenix. It's the very western edge of the Phoenix metro area. And there's an airport there, which I've flown in and out of quite a bit. And they're going to have an air show there. And I'm really looking forward to it. It's an official AOPA-sponsored uh, air show and it's free for AOPA members I think it's actually free for most everybody it's run by the city but <coughs> man <coughs> okay Tim Webb hello from Kentucky God bless all of you thank you uh, oh there's uh, Tom Srila in 
Sarasota. <laughs> and Leo says Gesundheit. Thank you. Um, Tom Bartman, cable question. Okay, is there any concern or loss with going from new LMR 400 run to an existing RG6 feed line to an inverted dipole? Okay, now RG6 is not actually designed for transmission. It's designed for reception. And it's very thin cable. It's got only a single strand in the middle, and then it's got some braid around the outside. One of the nice things about RG6 is it's dirt cheap. And you can pick it up anywhere. Now, the question is, can you use it for a feed line? The answer is yes, you can. Uh, I would do it on HF on the lower bands, although this stuff will receive uh, VHF and stuff like that. Uh, yes, you can use it in ham radio. Uh, it's it essentially is a drop-in for RG8X or something like that. It's it's uh, 70 ohms, something like that. But I mean, it's essentially a drop-in. You'll have to use the tuner in your radio. Now that will not carry anywhere near the power of LMR 400. I think I might consider RG6 if you're doing say a 40 meter dipole with 100 watts. That would probably work fine. But if you're going to go over that I wouldn't and if you've got any kind of a long run you know the L LMR 400 which is well over a dollar a foot probably over two dollars a foot by now. Is there any concern or loss with going from a new LMR 400 run to an existing RG6 feed line to an inverted dipole? You know if you're running a hundred watts and it's not dreadfully far away from the house by that I mean that much more than 50 or 75 feet you're probably not going to see much difference. So uh, go ahead and give it a try. One of the things I need to do and keep forgetting to do is going down to Home Depot and getting some RG6 and trying it and doing some one-on-one -on -one comparisons because RG6 is so cheap. Now one of the problems with RG6 the native connector for RG6 is the F connector. F as in Foxtrot, the F connector. And it's a super cheap crimp on connector that, uh, you know, a TV guy can put on in a couple seconds. Um, there are adapters that will allow you to screw that into an adapter that will take you to a PL259. Uh, the adapter will probably cost you about as much money as you spent on the RG6 in the first place. Okay. But yes, you can play with it. Jeremy uh, Walliser, hello Dave from W8TTW, hello. This overkill, should I wait to study for my general ham license being is changing this year? No. <laughs> it's changing in July, okay. You've got months months before the new one comes out. Will the questions be the same? They will certainly be similar. I have heard that there's going to be a number of changes but I haven't seen them yet so uh, I need to see them because I need to update the videos for the league. So uh, this overkill Louisiana here he's waving. Uh, Wayne Marsh hello Wayne N4QY0, White Bluff, Tennessee, 33 degrees, but ice on the roads. It's a good night to stay home. W4JMC, hope you get to feeling better, Dave. And best wishes. Um, Terrence, 2 Echo 0, India Papa Kilo. Hi, Dave. Hope you're keeping well. Minus 3 centigrade there in London. Yeah, my wife and I are just getting over COVID. So, still a little under the weather. Um, UDX640, 
Greetings all, North Carolina there. R.S. Dave, greetings from the California coast. You sound a bit under the weather. I'm just coming out of a COVID period. And um, I think it's going to take me another couple weeks to really be feeling back to myself. Uh, my assistant's supposed to be here tomorrow, and we're going to have to put some videos together, or otherwise we're going to run out. We have videos out through the end of January. I mean, we need to start making more. I've got my questions. People send in questions. And so we'll make a video uh, for these, so we'll have those videos. You know, I don't, I don't make up these questions. Um, I might modify one a little bit, but in general... Um, these are what people want to know the answer to, so that's what we try and do. Okay, um, what vertical multiband antenna as well as ICOM radio would you recommend? Uh, if you're talking about, I think, I'm guessing, you're probably talking about 2 meters and 70 centimeters. Uh, all of the ICOM radios are great. They'll do digital uh, doing D-Star. If you pick a Yesu radio, it will do C4FM, or what's called System Fusion. The Kenwoods also do uh, D-Star. If you pick up a Chinese radio, they do DMR. And there are repeaters for all four of those all over the country. Uh, the thing I would do is go with what your club members are using. If they all tend to be on Yesu and D-Star, then it's a good thing to do. You can also get radios from any of these vendors that are just FM only. Now, as far as an outdoor antenna for the car, MFJ makes a little mag mount that's only about this tall, and plop that in the middle after you very carefully wipe it down so you're not grinding dust into the top of the car. And then you run the cable. I usually run it back through the right rear door because that's the door that is used the least in the car. Because, you know, front, my wife and I. And then if I'm getting something out of the car, I have put it right behind me on the driver's side. So that's where I run the cable in and just shut the door on it. Connect that to the radio and you're doing fine. Now, if you're talking about an ICOM radio for, say, a home station for two meters, um, if you're just doing two meters, a J-pole is the way to go. You can get antennas from Ed Fong that will do two or three bands. You can get these from MFJ. The best place to call is DX Engineering. Tell them what you're trying to do. Have them recommend an antenna to you. Get that antenna. You mount it outside. Now that means a cable between there and inside. That also means grounding that silly thing to a ground rod out there because you don't want to do what I did once. I had a little uh, ICOM handheld and I connected it via the BNC connector to antenna on the roof and the static from the wind came through and blew out the front end of the radio. I, now I understand that's a mixed metaphor but the static creates electricity, static electricity on that and it was enough that when it got into the front end of the radio meaning the final output transistors it zapped them. So that was my bad, you know. Once it happens, shame on the world. Twice it happens, shame on me. So didn't let that happen again. I make sure everything actually has a path to ground. Now, if you're going to do something at home, you want to do a radio that will uh, fit nicely. I've got my VHF, UHF radio right there in the antenna or the microphone right there so now if you're talking HF I'd recommend the ICOM 7300 or if you want to go with the Yesu the FT710 is a very nice 
uh, radio from what I can see. I think it's a 710. Very nice radio. Uh, grounded. Uh, my video on grounding is number eight. It's one of the very first ones I did. And while I will not say that it represents absolutely current best practice, you won't go wrong using the stuff that's in there. Okay, so I hope that answers your question there. Okay, um, all right. We say that about Philomath organ. If they cannot pronounce it, they're likely an out of towner. Yes. Um, Philo Farnsworth was one of the inventors of television, the Fascan television in the U.S. He's a Utah guy. Um, Utah, every, every state is entitled to two statues in the Statuary Hall in Congress. And, of course, for years, they've only had one from Utah, and that was Brigham Young. Uh, and now they finally put the second one in, and now I'm talking, okay, 20 years ago. Um, and it's Philo Farnsworth uh, because of his uh, work with television. Really interesting. Okay, let's see. Um, hello, Dave. Chuck in northeast Kansas. New Ham, hope to get a station running this spring. Yes, please do so. I've been listening to you for several years. Thanks for all the info you share. Hope it is okay if I ask questions the coming months. Absolutely. That's what I'm here for. That's why we call this Ask Dave. I'm going to try and get you an answer. Uh, Glenn Martin, hot cinders and the high winds spread fires all over in paradise. Not just one fire, but multiple fires all over. A fire nightmare. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Um... Leo says, welcome to the field, Ray. Uh, by the way, winter field day is coming up. Optical Man Jeff adds $15 to the chat revenue and says, thanks, Dave. I hope you and Loretta will recover quickly. Take care and thanks. Um, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Adding to the chat revenues, what keeps the channel going? It does need resources to keep going. This overkill, they fell in it. Bill Myers, K-A-8-G-I-M, has added $10 to the chat revenue. Thank you so very much for doing that. Just wanted to say thanks for all the videos, tips, and advice over the years. You have certainly inspired me with the hobby. Well, Bill, thank you very much. Terry Hollowell says, uh, greetings from Rudolph, Ohio, K-E-8-C-V-A. Look forward to meeting up with you at Xenia. Prayers for a speedy recovery. Thank you. Um, we didn't go to Dayton last year because it's a big, hairy deal for us to go to Dayton. It takes longer for us to get there than the ham fest lasts. But um, I will... I think I may go this year. I missed going, and I think it was not good for the channel for me not to be there. I should be there. I should be meeting people, talking to people, getting ideas, talking to the vendors, and so on. And, uh, you know, I've always enjoyed the Dayton experience. Uh, it's just so doggone far away. You know, maybe if I, can, if I don't sell the airplane, um, I can fly there. That'd be fun. Now, if uh, I am there, uh, I will make sure that there is a period of time that's announced in advance that I will be at the ARRL booth. Uh, they have actually several booths, but one of them is, a, is for YouTubers. And so I'll be there for that. Um, have you heard the recent rumors about the league? Yeah. And they've been through this before. They'll get it sorted. There are enough people who will not put up with administrative uh, 
in ministry of you who will keep this from going too far. What, the, what they're talking about here is they're trying again to make the board less of a debate society, an open debate society, and more of an organization that pulls together to meet needs of the ARRL. In many organizations, nonprofits, the big job of the board is fundraising. My wife was a member of the Montrose, uh, let's see, what do they call it? Montrose Art Center, MAC. Um, and that was kind of what they were looking for. There was also an organization in Uray called uh, Weehawken Creative Arts. And it got taken over by the one sole person that they hired for money to run it. And all the original board members were pushed out. And now it's primarily an organization that teaches dance. And I'm not to say they do it badly, because I've seen one of their programs is actually quite good. But it started out as painting, sculpture, stuff like that. And that got kind of pushed aside. Uh, so these boards and things like that. Apparently this person who's in charge of this board really tore into the board one night and just gave them the what for for not supporting her and stuff like that. And I told my wife it's a very good thing I was not there. Because if I had been, I would have stopped her and says, you were talking to your collective boss. We hired you. Now you treat us with some respect. We actually bring an awful lot of experience, understanding of the community, and all these kinds of things to this organization. And you don't diss us. You don't speak poorly of us. We're your boss. And if you don't like that, you can go elsewhere. So, anyway, I wasn't there. I'm not a board member. Um, but I was pretty upset on behalf of my wife, the way they were treating her. But what they're trying to do with the board at the league is kind of close ranks so that they can push in a common direction without a bunch of dissent. Uh, people saying other things. And people do say other things. Personally, I like the board the way it is. The league's 100 years old. It's always worked this way. And it's worked well. And the league is serving amateur radio very well. Don't muck with it, is my opinion. But... I'm not on the board, so. <laughs> uh, let's see. That That's what I've been hearing about it. Uh, I believe it is the general, because it was last year, was it? A oh, warrant, I'm going to have to go check that, because I've got to be changing one set of videos here. The extras are my favorite, because, you know, they're, there's a little touch of engineering in there. Uh, okay, Warren, thanks. I'll take a look at that. Um, and thanks for your thoughts and prayers for a speedy recovery. Uh, Dennis Cornell, so hi Dave from Alaska, KL7HRO, minus two. Leo, thank you for answering my email. I have that ham clock on the way. I too have been taking a week off on account of not COVID, but a chest infection that seems to be floating around the Willamette Valley. Yeah, I, there are some nasty things floating around. Paid, and, and there's something called scabies that's starting to infect the U.S. It's a skin disease caused by a mite. And one of the ways that it is transmitted, as you can imagine, is with two people being intimate with each other. Um, but it can also be transmitted if these mites are left in bed clothing or anything like this. 
and it's actually reasonably easy to cure. Oddly enough, a drug that was brought to the attention of many it does not cure COVID, but it's ivermectin, and that does cure scabies. <clears throat> so we'll see what happens with that. You know, there's always something. There's always something. Okay. Well, I like the extra exam better. I enjoy that. Um, <clears throat> okay, so you have that ham clock on the way. Very good. I'll be very interested in how you like it. I have one like version 1.0 of that that thing. Okay, now Pedro, Dave, this chat is obviously making you better. Your voice and your appearance have improved significantly. Our best wishes to your love, Loretta. Well, thank you, and I will pass that on to her. Larry, oh, and Manila, good to hear from you. Uh, got a problem with my IC718? Keep shorting out when I transmit at times. Wasn't able to work some ready. You've got a real problematic radio there. Um, now I know it's very humid there, but it's very humid lots of places. So, um, don't know what's going on. Uh, Mark Perrin has added $50 to the chat revenue. And I want to say a special thank you to Mark. I really appreciate that. That helps keep this thing going. And says, I have been following you for years and have learned a lot from you. Thank you, uh, Victor Alpha 7, Delta Lima Charlie. And that's Canadian $50, which is not dreadfully different from American $50. The rates kind of go like this. Um, Larry says he thinks the shorting is in the microphone. I had trouble with a Kenwood microphone one time. It turns out in the microphone, there's a, a switch, a big piece of copper in here, that when you push this down, causes that copper to make contact. Now, what Kenwood was afraid of was that people would hit it so hard they'd break it. So they put a little foam pad on there, which would cushion the impact on the relay. And I had real problem with it one time when my wife was using it, and she'd hold in this, and and it wouldn't go into transmit. And she did not like it when I told her you got to push harder. Um, and that didn't help anyway. Uh, so I took the microphone apart, and I went, oh my goodness! In the past 15 years since I've had this radio that foam pad has gotten squashed. So I put a new foam pad in there. Works fine. Okay. Um, let's see. Thank you, Mark. I truly appreciate it. Victor Alpha 7, Delta Lima, Charlie. Um, Leo says, Larry had a similar issue with the mic. My 7300 turned out there was too long of a screw that held the clip on the back of the mic shorting out the electrical board. Hope that helps. That it could very well. But what happens a lot of time is people will take these things apart. I mean, there's two screws down here, and there's a screw right here, which although it looks like it just holds this on, actually goes in and holds the two halves together. And the screws don't go all the way through. And if some people, if they have trouble, they lose the screw. They'll just put any old screw in there, and you can cause a problem like that. Okay. Um, Chris Goodman, K0BLU, the Yale University Board of Directors, is quite tight-lipped about their proceedings. Yes, well, they're a private university. And, uh, you know, they had the same problem at Harvard with that uh, doctor... What was her name? Um... What got her was not her comments about taking sides, Israel versus the Palestinians. I mean, what she said, when you really think about it, is true. We got two groups of people fighting each other, and each side has got legitimate grievances. And each side is afraid of each other. 
And uh, it's like sometimes I've heard Canadians say about the U.S. It's like trying to sleep next to an elephant. The elephant rolls over. The elephant doesn't feel anything. But the guy sleeping next to the elephant sure does. So, um, that, okay, I, I can kind of understand it. But what got her was the plagiarism. That is inexcusable. And should affect her tenure, too, in my humble opinion. Uh, plagiarism in academic circles is an absolute violation of the principles of scholarly research. It's okay to take somebody else's idea, but you better put sources in there that said this is a really important idea and I got it from so-and-so in his paper. <clears throat> and <coughs> one of the things that scientists do is they look to see how many people are quoting their paper. That is a measure of academic success is to see how many people quote their paper. Um, and there was what was, by all accounts, an absolutely fabulous biography of Lincoln that was put together some 30 years ago. Everybody was giving it stunning reviews, and then somebody realized that this guy was just copying pages out of somebody else's research. And they actually pulled the book from publication rightly so and um, you know we do the same thing in ham radio uh, we're building upon each other's knowledge so if we're going to do an article in QST about an antenna we're going to say I got the original idea from so and so but here's what I'm going to do differently and if you're a really good guy you'll call a person and discuss the idea with them and you might get this guy to sign on But yes, Yale University is a private university literally worth billions. And they have a reputation to protect. And so they are an organization that sits behind the scenes. Same with Harvard, same with all the Ivy League schools. They sit behind the scenes and... I know even in our church, Mormon church, it's led by the brethren. And uh, it is a sort of a point of doctrine, really, where Jesus said, if you are not one, you are not mine. And uh, in the Mormon church, you have a lot of what are called presidencies. So like at the local level, there will be an elders quorum, which is kind of the men's side of things. And there's a president, two counselors, secretary. And it is standard operating procedure that if there's any issues in the presidency, they are hashed out in the presidency. And then when you are done and the decision has been made, that is the face that's put forward. So in many, many situations, that's proper. But we are not Harvard, we're not Yale, we're not a church. We are a membership organization of a bunch of very disparate people, each of whom has a federal license to talk. And most of us use that license freely in expressing our opinions. And so the board is set up with a voting, I mean, a a director who's just out of line can't bring things to a halt. That person can lose the measure that's being voted on. And that's fine. That's absolutely fine. And it's worked for 100 years. And I would say that this idea of presenting the unified front 
might be great for a private university worth billions. Uh, but not for a ham radio club. I mean, good grief. Of course, we have a executive board that meets in our ham radio club. And uh, they decide a lot of things, like budgets and so on. And uh, generally, they don't publicly disagree with what they've done. Say, I'm a member of the board. You know, and they bring up their objections in the board meetings. They hammer them out. And then we, as members of the club, don't have to put up with them. So, yeah. Okay. Let's see. MC619, New Ham since August of last year. Uh, congratulations. Studying for my general, I'm a truck driver, and there is not enough videos about truck driving hams. Well, um, KJ5CFG, there are some out there. Not a huge amount. Of course, you're doing your, your uh, citizens ban there, because all truckers do. But you could also be doing two meters, or for that matter, uh, digital, uh, digital voice uh, from the truck. Maybe you ought to send me to Ask Dave at ARRL.org. Send me some thoughts about this, and maybe we can put a video together. Larry it says the mic is an Andonis, and I believe it's in the battery. Maybe I changed it to the original handheld. But notice the radio will work okay, but may have to check it more. Okay. Bill Myers, K-A-H-E-A-M. Dave, I'm hoping to make it to Dayton this year for the first time. Uh, be prepared. It's huge. There's 30, th over 30,000 hams on that site. And it's a county fairgrounds. So you can imagine what it's like. Uh, if you don't like waiting in line, bring your own food. Um, so I hope you do, Making you meeting you in person would certainly be a major incentive to making the trip. Well, I'm going to have to try to do that. Uh, KE4ASC asks a question, what would make an ICOM 70 cents Mark IIG, which is one of their classic radios. It's a small radio, but it's HF. Power on and off rapidly and just quit. I don't see any damage to any of the boards. Okay, this is something you need to know about those radios. And this may or may not be the problem. There's battery in there. And the little battery is designed to maintain a couple little critical pieces of information. And if that battery is going dead, you keep losing that information. Now that battery normally would get a titch of a charge voltage every time you turn it on. By the way, there's a similar battery in the ICOM 7300. Um, but those batteries go bad after about 10 years. What you need to do is replace the battery. Um, now you're going to need some help doing that, so you're going to need to talk to somebody in your club or whatever about getting that done. Uh, and that would be the first thing I would do with the radio of that vintage. And it, without that memory being preserved, you can get unpredictable results. Okay, Alex, Alexei, uh, I have an idea to design a sort of universal BPS bandpass filter, LPF low pass filter, ATU, antenna tuner unit for a received transmitter front end. It's about eight relays per pole. Do you know any instance of such a device? No, I do not. Um, now, a lot of radios do use relays so that they'll go in and out and when they're on a band, the output is 50 ohms. Uh, Relays have kind of developed a bad name a little bit because they do wear out. Whereas a solid state relay uh, tends to last a little longer. Then you get into all kinds of things like signal diodes and so on. And while well, signal diodes are about a penny a piece, uh, they can 
go bad. So uh, what I would do with that, Alex, is talk to some of your friends and try something like that and see what it does for you. Um, Larry, we also get a lot of noise in the band, especially during our 40 meter net. I think it could be solar static. Been watching Dr. T on her solar predictions. Hmm. We are out of time, and I want to say a special thank you to Chris Goodman. He says, bless you, Dave, for your perseverance. And he adds $10 to the chat revenue. Uh, really, really appreciate it here. And we are out of time. So um, we're trying to... I'll, I'll be back tomorrow when Aiden comes. I'm assuming he's coming. The roads are not the world's best. Um, but he drives a four-wheel drive truck, so he should be able to get up here, no problem. Um, I just want to say to all of you, uh, I thank you enormously for your support during this little bout of COVID. I thank you very much for your financial support because it helps keep this, keep this going, keep us going and, and doing what we have to do. And I thank you for your questions. It's those questions that make this interesting. I mean, if nobody had any questions, how boring would life be? And everybody has questions. And there are no... The only stupid question is the one that is not asked. That if you had asked, it would have cleared up a mystery for you. So that's what you need to do. So thank you all very much. Send questions this way. And um, we'll see what we can do to have a wonderful time. I've got a number of products here to review, including an odd one. I'll just tell you what it is. If you're going uh, parks on the air, one of the things you need is water. Well, it turns out that Idaho, which makes power supplies and stuff, also makes a water purifier. So I said, send me one. I'll take a look at it. Because if you're out, say... Um, away from your car, you're in the park or something, there might be a stream. You don't want to drink that water. But if you can plop this hose into it and get water that's gone through reverse osmosis and all that, uh, you can do about there indefinitely. So uh, anyway, something to look at. I thought that'd be a little bit, you know, out of the ordinary to do. So I want to say thank you all to very much, uh, very much. Thank you all for everything you do to keep this channel going and until we next meet 73